This is a production of WKNO Memphis. Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by the WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. The impact of unfunded liabilities on the city budget tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. We're joined tonight at full table, Shea Flynn, Memphis City Council. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Thomas Malone, Memphis Firefighters Union. Thank you for being here. Thank you also. Jim Strickland, also with the Memphis City Council. Thanks Thank for you. coming back. Mike Williams from the Police Union. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. And Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. And I should say first, we tried, and I should say repeatedly, to get the city, the administration, someone from the administration to come in to talk about this. Um, and for whatever reason, we were unable to get them in. Hopefully, we'll get them in um, in the future. So we'll, we'll try to represent their views, but they were not able to be here to represent their own views. Let me start with a simple question, but it's, of course, not simple. There's an unfunded liability, pensions. Much of that is firefighters and police unions, but other, other uh, former employees. It's unfunded to some degree. I'll go left to right. How unfunded is it? What is the number? What is the gap? Well, that is the uh, $60 million question. Uh, it's anywhere from 40 to $80 million. Uh, the fighter fight fi per year. Per year. Okay. And then the overall unfundedness is several hundred million. But let me just focus on per year if, yeah. right now. Right now, we put about $20 million a year into our retirement system. Uh, the firefighters actuary says we should be putting in around 60 million. The city administration's actuary says we should be putting in around 100 million. The, uh, the city council just hired its own actuary to help solve that uh, riddle. And the, the city, and I'll turn to you, Bill, and put you on the spot as the city representative here, uh, like it or not. Uh, they say <laughs> their number overall, the funding gap that they came forward with two months ago, PricewaterhouseCoopers did a big you know, analysis for them. They said it is... $709 million. Okay. okay, after that, and we had you on the show, Thomas Malone, you, you all were skeptical of that number. You went out, you got your own actuary. Um, as you said bef before the show, actuary is about the, about the most boring thing you've ever dealt with. But just that number is not boring. The number you guys came up with was what? Well, well remember this, we came up with $301 million. Okay. That was using the city numbers. That was the, that's the big difference that I want to stress. We used the city's numbers and came up with the difference. And people are talking about the actuaries. As far as we're concerned, the city's own actuary said, do not use their numbers. Do not use their numbers. They put it in bold print in their report. Do not use their numbers for professional advice. So that was what parlayed us into going out and getting our own. But in agreement with the mayor's administration, we used the numbers that PwC we just came up with different uh, assumptions. And I should clarify, too, although you, you're representing the firefighters, your, your number is for all that unfunded liability, that's not correct. just that, for that's the, for the pension fund. And you, okay, and you, the, the police union, you basically in agreement, as well. and in agreement with that number? That is correct. Okay. Shay, it, it, it fundamentally, like if we just try to break it down, the number is a huge difference. So that's obviously a huge problem. The city council is going to get their own actuary. But it does, everyone agrees that it's unfunded to some degree, and it's, even if it's at the low end, it's quite a bit of money. Doesn't it come down to you, you pay for what's owed, I mean, by you raise taxes or you cut spending or you change the benefits for future retirees and or retired people, right? I mean, those are, I mean there's I mean, a lot or, of complexity, or, or, but that's... Or a combination of the three. And right. on, on the issue of, because I've been studying the different uh, value, you know, proposals from the firefighters. I haven't seen the police yet, so I'd be happy to look at that. And the administrations and the gap is based on the assumptions. And if you look historically, you know, it's probably, and I hope what the city actuaries, it's probably somewhere in the middle because I can say that like, for instance, on the firefighters one, they used an assumption of much lower salary increase over the term than the city did. And if you look at the history of it, they're probably correct on that. But at the same time, they used a different valuation at the start than the city. And historically speaking, the city's probably correct on that. And those are two big numbers. I mean, I think the salary one's like 156 million of the entire debt. And the, the, yeah. the fair market evaluation of the, the plan based on the smoothing 
is about 250. I mean, so that, that's the largest. There's some other, you know, uh, you know, l smaller amounts, you know, when you're talking $17 million small, but that's the big one. And that's why the city council had to get their own actuary right. to kind of, you know, three, three different opinions and you, you sort of Try get a clearer it. picture. But again, <clears throat> if it's, I'll go to you, Jim. I mean, if it, there's a gap and you pay for that by raising taxes, changing the benefits, cutting spending, or as Shay said, some combination of those. So wh what are you all, I mean, what are you, are you all contemplating right now in terms of whatever that gap is, how you're going to get there? Well, I think uh, nothing's contemplated by the council now because you've jumped ahead of some decisions mm -hmm. that we have to make to get there. Okay. We've got about four months to make this decision. And to me, there's two big issues. Um, what kind of plan, retirement system do we want? And we have several choices there. And then how do we pay for it? What kind of plan we have depends on how we pay for it because the price changes. To me, we have four choices in retirement systems. We could keep our pension system now, maybe tweak it here or there. We could go to what the mayor wants, which is a 401k type of system. And he wants to do that for all non-vested employees. Or we can do a hybrid system, part 401k, part uh, uh, pension, or go into the state system, which is a hybrid system. Right, and uh, they made that switch a couple years ago because of concerns about their funding levels. Correct. Okay. So we got to we have to go through that process, and and it's more than cost that's going to make that decision too. It's are we able to recruit the best and brightest firefighters and police officers under all these different plans? So it's more than cost that has to go into this decision. So we have to put all those together, make that decision, and then we have to determine how we're going to pay for it. But I do want those two decisions made at the same time. Okay. B Bill. Tom and Mike, uh, is, your, is your quarrel with the fact that there's a problem or is your quarrel with what the nature of the problem is and how big the problem is and which, if any of those four options that he outlined, do you think is acceptable? Well, I, I would say that if you're going to maintain the uh, level of quality of officers that you have in firemen, that you're going to have to uh, provide uh, pension plans that are commensurate with the work that's being done in Memphis and when you look at other cities. When you look at the five-year strategic plan, uh, and my problem <clears throat> with that is that they've picked and chose what they wanted to out of that plan. Because the city of Memphis has only been, up until 2010, they only put 5% of payroll into the pension fund. After 2010, they started putting 6%. Even if you provided Social Security, you got to put at least 6.2%. Uh, whereas you can't just not give the officers and the firemen uh, the benefit of the doubt. If they're going to put their lives on the line in this city, then you're going to have to provide... Uh, uh, pension funds. The other thing is, is that um, I don't think that you have to raise taxes. I think there has to be some prioritization. You don't have a fifty-seven million dollar obligation to the schools anymore. You cut, uh, you increased taxes last year from three hundred nine to three thirty-six to three forty-one. Uh, you shut down uh, community centers, senior citizen centers. Ever since this administration has been in office, all they've done is cut, 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 cut. But every year they come in and say that there's a deficit. And I don't understand because you haven't really provided the core services mm -hmm. to the citizens of this city that, that should be provided as far as I'm concerned because I am a citizen of this city as well. So it's a matter of prioritization. And also in that five-year strategic plan, uh, we provide or have been putting almost the lowest amount into the pension fund than anybody almost in the nation. Because when you look at uh, the other cities in that five-year strategic plan, they go anywhere from 12.3% all the way up to 43% of payroll into the pension fund. And I'm not saying that you have to do that, but we haven't done anything to provide. Uh, and, and even though the city has only put 5 and 6% in, we still have a good pension plan. There are discrepancies uh, between what the pension board reports and what the city is reporting. Right. And okay. we were talking about before the show. I mean, the, the fund mm -hmm. needs to be, uh, round numbers, you know, needs to be, by your guys' calculation, I think something like $2.5 billion. It's right at 2.2. So, you know, on so some level, level you look at some of these places like the state of Illinois or mm -hmm. Detroit, at the, you know, where they had nothing, right. you know, in there. It is not as far off as it might sound, right. given the, the kind of 
um, criticism that's come the, about the, about the, the underfunding. The one thing that has gone missing in all this discussion, first of all, out of the total general fund, the pension obligation is about 3.1 percent. That's the city's numbers. Secondly, the, the in, current currently what it's being correct. Is, okay. Secondly, in 2008, we were 104.5 percent funded, and the worst recession since the Depression right. hit. Yeah. Now it has rebounded back, and we're of the opinion, and you got to understand when we talk about unfunded liability to the general public, that means if we had to pay it today. Right. That means everybody out there, if you had to pay your mortgage today, everybody's going to lose their home. Right. That's why the system's set up right. that we're paying it on an annual but, basis. But part of the concern isn't it that that you know what fire and police department are eighty percent of all city employees mm -hmm. and sixty percent of the general fund mm -hmm. spending. And I don't think anyone would say that that, that they don't want fire and police. That's right. not the point. But it's a big part of it. So some some of what's come about is I think the administration, they, who's the PFM advisor? There's an advisor right. group they got. Yeah. They said, look, can we change some of the ways that our current spending on? on police, on mm -hmm. firefighters? Mm -hmm. Can we get more civilian people to do work than uniformed people work? Have the uniformed people out on the street patrolling and get uniformed people out of clerical work and so on. Again, I'm trying to represent right, the right, administration right, positions. Right, right. They're not here, right. despite being invited so many times. So it's more than the 3%, I think critics would say, because you. there's so much funding that of the city's budget right. goes to city. But we're <clears> only, <throat> you know, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? Right. You know, they, they, they try to demonize the city employees to say, and, and I'm not talking about everybody, but they try to demonize city employees and say, oh, we pay 70% of payroll to city employees. Well, the citizens pay for core services. They don't pay to right. uh, develop buildings and all of this other stuff for the city. They pay for community centers and libraries and, and, and street pavement and, and different things like that. Yeah. And they also pay so that they'll have emergency services available to them. Sure. So when you say, well, uh, the employees are 70 percent of, of payroll, well, that's me as a citizen. That's what I pay my money yeah. for. Well, let me, let me say one more and then I'll get shaved. This is really concerns me. And, and I, I mean, no, no disrespect yeah. to this, but it appears that everything that happens, as Mike said earlier, that we want to take from the employees, that it's taken 35 years to get to this level, 36 years to get to this level. And I'm, I'm really mystified by the fact that when we had the school system, and that was a total debacle, and the city didn't put their money in, and they made bad judgments, as what we are in right now, I never heard them say to the teachers that you all are going to have to pony up and pay because the city didn't pay. Yeah. And now that's what they're telling our employees, mainly fire and police, as you say, that we got to have your stuff back. Yeah. And, well, I and, think I do think that I, I don't know about city officials. There were certainly a lot of citizens who wanted to take money back from teachers. I mean, because again, you get people who are out there who say <clears throat> unions they make too much money, they get these benefits, and there's there are lots of of people who just feel like unions abuse their their sure. their authority. Yeah. I mean, so the teachers unions take it in the same at, way that, that if that you look at the history of these benefits. We, when 1978, when the citizens gave us bargaining rights after the 78 strikes, we, we put a system in that said we will never have that again. And we have an impasse yeah. procedure that the council yeah. is the dispute mechanism. They are the last say. Now, when, when, when all this comes about, a lot of these benefits were forced on us by the city in lieu of them pay. Yeah. The, like the two holidays they keep bringing up. They said, well, we got two extra holidays. That was at them pass. Yeah. They said, we're not giving you any money, but we're going to give you these two holidays. Well, we don't want two holidays. We want the money. Let me go to you, Shay. Is there a need, <clears throat> not just in the pensions, but again, when you talk about these folks represent a huge amount of the city funding, um, is there a need to right-size that to make changes? I mean, the, the city is up against, some people would say, a lot of challenges. You know, they can't raise their taxes anymore. They've got to make priorities. Is there a need, not just on the pensions, but in the way services are delivered, that, that changes need to be made? Yes. That is the core question. It goes to what Mike was talking about. And at least from my point, it's not a demonization. Mm -hmm. It's not a philosophical argument when you say that police and fire and personnel represent such a large. It's just explaining the math. You know, in many ways, this it becomes a math problem. And that's at the root issue that we're dealing with. And it goes to what Councilman Strickland said about whatever change you make, whatever you pick from column four, 
how you pay for it is going to be an issue because there, there's other problems that overlap. I mean, the, <clears throat> that we've talked about so many times on this show and in other places, the, the gap between our property tax rate and our competing cities' property tax right. rate, the drag that has on economic development, the loss of population. And, and it's not just the property tax rate, it's crime. So if you, you hurt the right. police, yeah. you know, I mean, yeah. there's a lot of overlapping things. And this is a very serious conversation. And, and sometimes the politics of it take it away from true, the true gravity of it. It's how do you pay for this? How do you do it where you don't lose recruits? How, how do you, when you say right size it, where you're still delivering those core services to the citizens? It is a complicated thing. It is made of decades of choices that have been made, and, and how you fix it is going to be a very pivotal conversation for the community going forward because the reason the issue is when you look at our funding rate today, but the, the growth of the liabilities, the growth of people entering the plan as retirees, all that is outstripping how much we're, we're going to have to continue right. to put more and more into it, which sucks away from right. core services. And how do you get to a balancing thing? It is really, well, really it's tough. Part of, and I'll go to Bill but it's part, you know, you pick up the paper and you can see every community in the country is having this conversation on one level or another, the state level, the city level, county level, of because how they all those promises made back in the 70s, how do you fulfill them for the private sector? But also you see, you know, big public companies, GM, the, 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 the big four auto companies, big promises that were made and now they're having to shift those. And, but, and Tommy can probably correct me, but in 2007, I believe, was the year <coughs> they changed the GASPI rules, the accounting governmental accounting standards rules that all of the this debt had to be listed as a liability on your your balance sheet before that time yeah. governments didn't have to do yeah. it so that's why you've seen the spotlight come on and and, and you got to get your arms which they have taken the arc off now the the, the new gasby mm -hmm. rules you do not have to put the arc on your on your liability sheet anymore. Okay. This is uh, this is pretty deep stuff. I don't know. Because we've got this gas and We told you it was going to be exciting. Yeah, we're yeah. In, we're that was the only word I had on here, Bill. We're, <laughs> we're in pretty deep water here. But but the, the council has started to talk uh, uh, in depth and and to a certain level of detail about public safety services. And this is the council that came into office in 2008 talking about more boots on the street. So, Jim, let, let, let me ask you, is, is this a rethinking of that philosophy? It is certainly a review of that philosophy. Uh, one thing that the PFM efficiency study or report or whatever they call it showed us was that when we took office, we knew we had about 1,900 police officers. We wanted to get up to 2,400, and we did that. But what the report says is that extra 500 police officers, none of those boots hit the street. That the number of police officers on the street were still 1,900. That's what the report says. I don't know if that's true. Mike and police director can tell us. But the report clearly says that, which was shocking to me. But we do need to have a review of and a public discussion, not just us down at City Hall. Do we want uniformed police officers to respond to every single traffic accident, injury and non-injury. We, we do that. Some cities do not. Do what do they, they send a, a, some kind of official uh, person, or, but... Uh, you can either have a PST type mm -hmm. of system or okay. not send anybody. In a right. non-injury accident, right. some cities don't send any police officer. So we need to have that discussion as a community. Do we really want uniformed officers to do that? And we have not had that community discussion. Uh, there's all, do, do, do we want police officers to respond to every single alarm a call? Yeah, you know? when the, the, the private alarms, the, the Brinks alarms. Correct, and so, and and so and many of those are false alarms. Right, you know, isn't the it 95% or, I mean, some it's, horrendously yes, high number. Because the dog pushed the door open no, or and a I'm cat. I'm not guilty of it. I mean, yeah, I have half two. the people at the table probably have I have so. two. So we need to have that group discussion, and, I, and I'm really emphasizing not just at City Hall. We right. need to get the community involved because uh, I want to hear what they, what level of service they want. Mm -hmm. let, let's, uh, like, let's hear what Mike thinks. Well, <laughs> I was going to say we're reinventing the wheel, actually. 
uh, because we talk about police not responding to every traffic accident. We used to have the PST program to whereas uh, they alleviated the police from traffic accidents. We used to have individual uh, civilians that actually worked in the precincts, but those positions were cut as well. So now we're talking about putting those positions back. Um, the director just stated at council, and everybody is hailing the fact that crime is down in the city of Memphis. Right. Well, if, if in fact, and I beg to differ, because I know you can do anything with numbers, but if in fact crime is down, so now we're going to cut the force uh, that actually was able to bring crime down in this city and headed in a downward motion, and we're going to, uh, uh, we have precincts right now that we have wards that are not covered. They're robbing Peter to pay Paul at these precincts. We don't have enough sergeants. We don't have enough lieutenants. Uh, we haven't had a promotional process. They're about to throw the police department into a tailspin, as the director has said. Then they want to say, well, the drop plan is not working. Uh, the drop plan is fine. What is what the drop is, plan? Uh, it's the uh, deferred retirement uh, option. option plan. Okay. It's early, an early retirement right. plan. Right. Okay. No, what no, it, no, 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 no. Thank you. You announce your retirement three, two or three years in advance. And what okay. it does is allows the administration to predict where they're going to have vacancies. Okay. But if you're not feeding anything into the system, then the system is not going to work. The drop plan did not cost the city anything because essentially when those guys got in the drop, the pension funds started paying those guys. And because of their continued services, then the city would actually pay them for working. But it allowed them the ability to predict. So we have 146 officers right now that are going to retire within the next three years. We have 190 that have left in the past two years. Plus, we also had vacancies. We should be down to around about uh, 2,100 police officers right now, I think, boots on the ground. And it's going to get very interesting in the next couple of months, especially when summer comes around. And let's switch to the fire department. I mean, the one thing that's been talked about is closing fire stations. I mean, there's been over the year a whole over the years a whole lot of shift of population Wait. away from certain neighborhoods and certain areas out east. <clears throat> and that critics will say, uh, critics will say, the the fire department hasn't adapted to that. That there's over coverage in certain areas, and we could stand to close some stations. We we went through a a restructuring plan. The, the director. Yeah. Uh, we've lost seven ladder trucks, one heavy rescue, one engine, and approximately 130 to 40 personnel. And if you look at these, if I may, I'd like to get sure. back to this consultant report that Councilman yeah. Strickland was talking about. This same consultant says, well, if you, if you don't have an active company out east, let's cut some of the staffing off of there. Two days later, a 7,400-square-foot home out east right. caught on fire. Now, how would that homeowner feel? If we sent a skeleton crew because he hadn't used us before, number one. Number two, this same consultant promoted privatizing our EMS system. We have just been touted as one of the number one systems in the country. Yeah. So I'm at a loss when you talk about the fire service. We are rolling the dice with our staffing. Yeah, how do you how do you reconcile this? How does city council, how's the administration right? I'm putting you on the spot. Can you uh, the answer? I mean, because you're no one wants that. No one wants, no one on council, no one in the administration wants someone to have to wait too long for fire or EMT or or police. Well, the, there, here's so how do you find the balance in this when you're talking about this huge dollars and you're, by the way, got to fund to some degree some sort of unfunded liability? Well, that, that's you know, <laughs> that's where the art meets the science here. And the public's going to have to be engaged in this, you know. And I've got some other comments about the PFM study, and we but, that, left, so. but but that that's what it comes down to. With you know, you've heard everything they've said about we can't cut police, we can't cut fire. You've heard that that makes up seventy percent of our budget, mm -hmm. right? Just that, and then you've heard that we've got anywhere from a forty to an eighty million dollar liability coming in here, and if we can't cut, yeah. well, guess where it's going to come from? the taxes, and we know our taxes are too high, and we could lose more population if we do that. We could see slower in economic growth. This is a very real, right. real but issue. You, and again, we've said it earlier in the show, we could lose more population if the perception is there aren't good fire and EMT services, and certainly crime is just, already an issue. You just raise taxes yeah. when you've when, when, yeah. got to pay for the light, light poles. But, but, but if you go back to 2008 in, in the schools, Mayor Harrington at that time was proposing, I believe, a 58 cent tax increase, which would have raised our taxes up to a 401 level. Last year during the budget, I made it very clear 
that if you want, and this is without taking the pension into consideration, if you want to fund the government that we currently have, it is about a $4.03 rate. Yeah. If you think that the small businesses in this city are going to survive right. at that rate, you're kidding yourself. Yeah. We got uh, two minutes we left. We were at 379 in the early 80s. I'm early, early 70s. I'm just going to say, yeah. I beg to differ because when you guys came in, one thing I do tout you for is that you did lower taxes. So we're not at the current tax levels than we were when you guys first got in office. So we are paying less. And right. we have been paying less for services. And we haven't been funding the ARC. Yeah. Well, they yeah, weren't I mean, doing, we've been, yeah, doing it before by, you by came by in anyway. anyway. Let me ask you, Jim. The, the state has, there's a bill rolling, Senator Norris from Collierville. It's a statewide bill, actually, because there, there are many areas that have uh, municipalities that have some problems with their unfunded liabilities. Are, what do you think that's going to mean? Um, there'll be, there'll be some state representatives at city council in a couple of weeks. What kind of pressure does that put on you all? Well, it, it, first I want to tell you what the bill is because there's some confusion. Right. Yeah. Uh, we are underfunded on our yearly contribution, the ARC, and the whole plan is underfunded. So there's two underfundedness, is if, that, if that's a word. The bill only affects our yearly contribution, and it says within six years, every city, every county needs to fully fund their annual contribution to their retirement system. It does not address the underfundedness of the entire plan. I think everyone is in uniform support of fully funding our annual contribution. In fact, I don't think we ought to take six years. I think we ought to take two years, get it fully funded, whether it's 60 million or 100 million, get it fully funded sooner than later. I, I agree with that two year pro process. And I think that's important because you look at politics. Next year's gonna be a re-election year. And then the year after that, a bunch of people are going to be term limited. So there's a lot of room for political gamesmanship. Whereas if we take a two year plan, not only do okay. labor and the people get to hold us accountable for our decisions, but it forces everyone to come to the table. All right, it. you get the last word. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Join us again next week.